because for, for Halloween, I have to be Kel Travis Kelsey and my girlfriend will be Taylor Swift. So, <laughs> it'll be great. It's going to take me a little bit of time. Uh, I think that's Jordan Locke. Wilson, there's somebody coming over there. Could you uh, open that up for me, please? So, so we're going to have a couple Thanks. weeks of uh, some uh, danger zone. Oh, it's going to be not even danger zone. It's going to be that bad. <clears throat> Anyways, um, hey, uh, if you would go ahead and turn in your Bible, if you have a physical Bible, to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, if you don't have your Bible, but you have your phone, that works too. Regardless, I would love to encourage you all to invest in a physical Bible. There's nothing like marking it up and underlining and highlighting and, and doing all that kind of stuff and getting your physical hands on some paper. Plus, you look like a special Christian when you have one that's carried around. So. What should it be, thumb index or not? Uh, just, just if you're older than 60. That's how you can tell. Just if you're older than 60. Oh. Um, okay, so, hey, before we jump into tonight, uh, I'm going to start off with this uh, video from Billy Graham. Time is short. What is your life? It's even a vapor that appeared for a little time and then vanishes away. If I told if someone had told me when I was 20 years old that life was very short, and would pass just like that, I wouldn't have believed it. And if I tell you that, you don't believe it either. I cannot get young people to understand how brief life is, how quickly it passes. It seems like yesterday I was in school. Every one of us here has been given the same amount of time in a day. 1,440 minutes a day, 168 hours per week. 70 years God allows us. And it's interesting to me with all of our medical science, we've never passed that magic mark. The average American male today lives 70 years and four months. The average female, 73 years and six months. More people live to be seven, but the average age of an American is still 70 as taught in the scriptures. What a thing it is when you think that you have just one short life to stay. I'd write down my priorities in life. And I'd get committed to certain priorities. Now is the accepted time. The things we ought to do, the classes we ought to take, the books we ought to read. Do it now. The family that needs you, spend more time now. Write that letter home now that you've been meaning to write money you ought to give, give now. Time to study, do it now. People you ought to witness to, do it now. Every time the clock ticks, it seems to say now. Today, if you would hear his voice. There may not be a tomorrow for you. And for me. Because there's a warning to time. Time is running out for all of us. Time is too short for indecision and vacillation. Do not halt between two opinions. Fools say that time is long. Every morning we have 86,400 seconds to spend at your best. And each day the bank name time opens a new account for you and for me. It allows no balances and no overdrafts. If you fail to use the day's deposits, the loss is yours. The Bible says redeem the time because the days are evil. And the days in which we're living are very evil. If there was ever a time for the gospel that can transform the human heart, it's now. Jesus said as long as it is day, we must do the work of him that sent us. The night is coming when no man can work. The night is going to come in your life. Yet there was a serenity about the work of the Lord Jesus. It's the quality of life, not the length. Jesus only had 33 years and ended on the cross. To the world, he was a failure at that moment. Yet at the end of his life, he said, I'm 50 years old. It doesn't matter whether you live another year or three years or five years. Will your work be finished? Is there a quality to it? Is there a dedication to it? Suppose all of our members tithe their time to witness for Christ as we tithe our income for the church. 
fill your heart with the word of God. I found that those who know the scriptures are the ones that have the power today. But we need men and women who walk with God. And if you do that, you too can finish the work that God gave you to do. And help us to realize the brevity and the urgency of time. And may we invest what little time we have short and if you look around in this room right now you'll see a variety of ages a variety of people a variety of life stages some in their 20s some in their 60s a few in their 70s and just like Paul was doing to Timothy in this letter he seems to be saying in, in, in this letter to, to his son in the faith time is short Know what matters. Understand what matters. Understand what you're being called to. And for every one of us in this room, when we think about this letter from Paul to Timothy, and we think about the things that Paul seems to be telling Timothy about the gospel, we say, doesn't Timothy already know this? Timothy, his son in the faith, a man that Paul left behind in Ephesus to lead a church. So why is he reminding Timothy of such basic principles? It's because we need to be reminded of that every day, every hour, every minute. Because we forget. Life happens, time is short. And today, when we look at the second half of 1 Timothy, we're going to see just what Paul highlights as the most important thing Understand about your time, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I really want to commend you for being here today. I know that we have long days of our work days. I know that many of you have families at home or a wife even potentially next door. Right now you have things that you want to do and even, even just fun things, right? Like Ryan, his Phillies are playing right now, and he told me right before class started, he said, this is more important. Wow. This is more important. And you said the same thing by showing up today, so thank you for that. And that's why I believe that this letter is for you. And this letter is for me. So we're going to look today at 1 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 12. But before we start in verse 12, before we read 12 through the rest of the chapter, I want to ask you if anybody could give me a couple highlights from Kirk's message last week. What was, uh, what was Kirk talking about that Paul was trying to communicate to Timothy in the first half of chapter 1? Beware of false teachers. Beware of false teachers and endless genealogies and myths that don't matter. Anything else? That was a good summary, Chip. Don't miss what, what, what was Paul reminding Timothy of at the very beginning of 1 Timothy. Don't miss it. Love. Love. A God of grace and peace. He starts off his letter and he says, don't forget, the God we serve never changes. In fact, I was reading Nehemiah this morning, and if you know anything about Nehemiah, the Israelites are coming back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls of the city and then rebuild the temple in the city. And in chapter 9 of Nehemiah, Ezra comes onto the scene. And Ezra is a man of God, and he, he starts to list in chapter 9, he says, hey, remember how God brought us out of Egypt? Remember how he, he, he gave us the law at the top of the mountain? And yet we worship the golden calf. And then remember how he forgave us and, and we went into Israel and then we began to intermarry with the foreign nations. And then remember how God sent us judges and then we wanted to do what was right in our eyes. And then remember how, God, and he just kept going through their history. We have to be reminded that God never changes with us. 
That's part of the reason why we need this letter today, just like Timothy did from Paul, to be reminded of what is true. So let's start off uh, by reading verse 12 through 20. I'm just going to read this out loud. Feel free to follow along. I'm also going to have it on the screen if you'd rather read it on there. And just so you know, uh, before I read this, um, we're going to do something a little bit different tonight than we normally do. I'm going to teach for probably about 10 minutes, and then you guys are going to talk around your tables for 10 minutes. And then I'm going to teach for 10 minutes, and then we're going to talk around our tables for 10 minutes. Uh, we're just trying this tonight and seeing if this works better for uh, the facilitation of our discussion. All right? Hopefully that will keep us engaged and be good. Let's start in verse 12. I'm going to read from the ESV version. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Four more verses. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So we're going to work our way tonight in four sections through these verses. And the first one that we're going to look at tonight, we're going to talk about the trustworthy service. What is this trustworthy service that we as Christians are called into, just as Paul was, just as Timothy was? Then we're going to talk about the trustworthy saying, which is just a, a fun other way of viewing the gospel in a fresh, a fresh different way. We're going to pause for a second and look at the trustworthy one when Paul seems to break out into song and doxology randomly in the middle of this section. And we'll ask a question of why. Why did he do that? Lastly, we're going to talk about the trustworthy response and look at this dichotomy and this comparison between Timothy and Hymenaeus and Alexander. Because it seems to me that we have a choice to make. And either we can find ourselves in the lane of Timothy, faithful, true, pursuing the Lord, or Hymenaeus and Alexander, and shipwreck our faith. I know which one I want to find myself in. So first, the first section let's look at is the trustworthy service. This is verse 12 through 14. <clears throat> so Paul, uh, which we could argue was one of the most Christ-like people to ever walk the earth, was not always Christ-like. Paul was born into a Jewish household, and at the age of 13, he was sent into Judea to learn from a rabbi named Gamaliel. Gamaliel shows up a couple times in Scripture. In fact, he's one of the people at Jesus' um, trial that ask a question. Are we sure about this? And he gets kind of beat down and pushed away. He's, he's understanding maybe a little bit of something. And Gamaliel was this rabbi and this, this high uh, person in the order of, of the Jewish order. And so Paul is coming in, who he was then Saul. He was coming in at age 13 to learn from Gamaliel. Now this learning would lead him to be on track to become a member of the Sanhedrin. And a lot of you have probably heard that term before. You've probably heard the term Sanhedrin before. Now, the Sanhedrin, to put it in our terms, it would have been like the Jewish Supreme Court, right? This was made up of 71 men who ruled over Jewish life and religion, just like our Supreme Court is kind of the highest order of, of the law in our nation. Now, Saul would show up in Scripture for the first time at the stoning of Stephen, who was the first martyr of the church. 
and he would be holding the cloaks or the cloaks of the men who were doing the killing were being laid at his feet, which just showed you how far Saul had already risen up in the ranks. I mean, he was the Jew of Jews and the Israelite of Israelites. He was the guy, all right? He was up and coming, uh, younger, but definitely up and coming. Paul would then start a campaign against Christians. He would arrest them. He would actually go to Damascus in order to bring those Christians back to Jerusalem for trial, which could definitely lead them to their death. Now, this was all before his radical encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus that would change the trajectory of his life. And like you and I, Paul had a history of being an enemy of Christ before his conversion. So when we read, I want you to look real quick. I want you to look at verse 12 through 14, and, and you'll see that in verse 13 he says, Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. That might not make sense to the culture of his day, right? Because he was, like I said, he was kind of the guy. But he begins to understand after this encounter with Christ, no, 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 I, I was his enemy. I was, I was a blasphemer. I was his opponent. And sometimes we can read verse 13, like maybe you're like me, and at an occasion when you read those statements that he's making, you think, at least I'm not that bad. At least, I, at least I'm not a blasphemer known as an opponent or known as X, Y, and Z, but may we not forget that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That we all deserve death because of this. But that we have been extended a life in Christ through his substitutionary atonement for us while we were still sinners. And while we were still sinners, we were Christ's enemy. The Bible says that somebody would hardly die for a good man. Who would die for a bad man? Think about your own life. Think about the people in your life that you would say right now that you would die for. Now I want you to imagine somebody who has wronged you. Who, who maybe in moments of your life you have viewed as an enemy. Who maybe you have been at <coughs> odds with. Or, or maybe you just kind of know them a little bit, but you're like, that's a person I would never want to spend time with. Now imagine dying in their place. It, it's almost uncomprehendable for us to understand because we even hesitate probably to die for some people in this room. David, and we, David would die for me. I'm just wrong. For sure. I know, I know that. Yeah. He's told me. I can see it in his face. You guys have a good relationship. But we would hardly die for each other in here. And I, I'm not saying that to shame each other. I'm just saying we love each other. We care for each other. Jesus died for us when we were his enemy. And Paul began to understand that when he was going to Damascus. And, and Jesus appeared to him and said, why are you persecuting me? Now, if you know the story, Saul wasn't persecuting Jesus specifically. He was persecuting his church. He was persecuting his body. And yet Jesus was equating that with persecution of himself. And so we must understand as we get into this scripture today and we get into this teaching, we must understand our position with Christ. Just like Paul did I can't imagine how it must have felt when Saul was blinded and he was led to Damascus by the people he was traveling with and he spent three days without eating or drinking anything. Can you imagine how dark that place must have been for him? Just sitting there in agony, wondering, what have I done? We don't necessarily dwell in this because we, we, the Lord doesn't want us to sit in our shame, but we also need to understand our position, which is exactly what Paul is doing here. Because that 
description of himself that maybe sometimes you in your moments of self-hate or me in my moments of self-hate find myself calling myself, you blasphemer, you adulterer, you murderer. He doesn't stop there in this section. Let's read the text backwards. If we're looking at verse 13, why is he saying go formally? What, what, what is that coming after? If we look in verse 12, he says, Jesus Christ has judged me faithful. From what? From what? You do nothing to deserve it. And then he says, appointing me to his service. Paul is moved to praise because although he understands his position with Christ, Christ has still seen him as faithful. He has still seen him as worthy to appoint to his service. And men, he still sees you as faithful. Because praise God, when God looks at us, if we truly have declared that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, when the Father looks at us, he sees his Son. What a wonderful, what wonderful news that is. This service that Paul is appointed to is the service that we have now gotten the baton of. And as the race has been being run, Paul is handing the baton off to Timothy, and Timothy hands it off to the next person. And can you believe it? It's been handed off to us. <clears throat> think about that for a second. I mean, I, my mind is blown to think that I am running the race that Paul was running. That I'm running the race that Timothy was running. That I'm running the race that Jesus looked at somebody like Paul and said, I want you. Because in verse 14, this grace of the Lord overflowed for him. And then he's going to get into that a little bit more. But before we talk a little bit about the trustworthy saying, I want you to take 10 minutes and I want you to Talk about these three questions, or as many as you can, around your table. So, I'm going to start a timer for 10 minutes. I'll give you a warning when we have two minutes left, and then I'll give you a warning when we have 30 seconds, all right? So, uh, please discuss around your table. Ready? Go. Go for it. <laughs> 